Welcome, everybody. I uh, organized a little bit what do I speak about. Usually I address uh, scientific conferences and I go as deep as need to be. So um, it actually forced me to think a bit more laterally and I hope that um, the presentations actually make, make some sense to you. I thought of the uh, living with fossil fuels technology perspective and it's really sort of just an overview of my, uh, my, my beliefs of, uh, of energy technology for fossil fuels. This is fairly simplistic, but um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, um, misinformation available in the media and on the net. Everything is pollutant. Uh, the fact is, uh, CO2 and water are products of combustion. You cannot burn fossil fuels without producing CO2 and water. Now, the rest of them are a, uh, uh, pollutants. These are a, uh, residuals from uh, the combustion process, which we need to be able to also get rid of. I'm not going to concentrate on those at all, although uh, the assumption is that, uh, that there is, uh, the technology is mature to deal with them. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the legal framework uh, is, uh, is in existence in that uh, uh, the EPA and so on will get into you if you start polluting to some extent. Where I'm going to concentrate on is more on the carbon dioxide in particular, and I think that's been under discussion in the public domain for quite a while. I started to, uh, I wanted to show this in a way. This is a projection by the, uh, energy, uh, by the uh, uh, International Energy Agency, and they're saying that uh, uh, by uh, 2050, if we to actually achieve the target of half of the levels uh, in the year 2000, we need a, uh, a solution which involves all of these different technologies. Obviously, as Barry would ask, what sort of assumptions went into actually producing this figure? Well, obviously, I'm not going to list all of them. I, I didn't produce the figure in the first place. But the point I want to drive in here is simple, is that in our capacity today, we cannot find a magic solution. Magic, the, the, there isn't one. And the uh, solution is going to be multifaceted. And as the list here shows, there are going to be uh, yeah, different solutions which are all going to work together. The size of this um, uh, triangle, if you want, may change depending on market forces and other, uh, uh, other factors as such. I would only concentrate and like to draw your attention to the bottom of the, of the figure in there and see the word efficiency and fuel mentioned three times, and there's a substantial uh, component of the CO2 reduction is going to come from this. And this is where I'm going to concentrate. Uh, the top part of the slide, uh, which is uh, carbon capture and storage, and that's going to be addressed by John uh, later in this session, so I will, not, uh, I will not talk about that. And I'm going to take renewables as a fact. It's going to happen to some extent. So how do we mitigate the impact of fossil fuels? On the, on the environment, assuming that we need them. Of course, we do. Um, I came up with three different suggestions. The first is energy efficiency. The second is what I call hybridization. And the third, which I'm not going to address, which is sequestration and that burying CO2 underground or under the sea also. So under energy, energy efficiency, and again, the word efficiency is used quite uh, uh, loosely in, in the literature. Is it uh, efficiency of energy usage, or is it efficiency of generating of the energy itself, or it's transporting it? So there's a lot of uh, uh, um, different definitions, if you want. I'm going to, this why I listed underneath it, three different things. One is reduced demand. Second is uh, utilize waste heat. And third, innovative uh, technology. So the first one really talks about uh, efficient use of energy, if you want. And I'll talk about the second one, which is something we are working on in the Center for Energy Technology. So let's deal with our reduced demand. And that, um, how do we actually reduce the, uh, so uh, if we want to produce less uh, CO2 or emit less CO2, let's use less energy to some extent. And how can we do that? Obviously, public education and awareness, I think, is crucial. There is projection that if we actually make the public more aware, we could save up to 61%. What assumptions are used to produce this, I have absolutely no clue. But what I'm trying to say is that 
at least here in Australia, we do have some, uh, a, um, I guess, uh, we are conscious of the environment, we want to do the right thing, and there's a lot of people in the Western world actually who feel this way. The other thing is smart control. We seem to sort of have an on-off switch. Is we don't concentrate too much and actually uh, efficient use of the energy. Um, I'll, I'll give some examples later. And obviously, to reduce uh, the, the consumption, you need to put some price on carbon so it's become more expensive. I know many in Australia will not like me saying that, but I think this is inevitable. So here's an example, and I, I kept it as simple as possible in a way, you know, where we, we could all replace incandescent lamps with, with CFL, yeah? We could all use motion sensors, or um, we could put insulation, you know? or uh, we could use heat pumps for heating and cooling. I mean, I don't understand it. 40% of our energy in buildings is, uh, is for heating and cooling. Why can't we actually use underground, where there's a stable temperature, to improve the efficiency of building heating and cooling? Um, a uh, hybrid cars. I'm a proud owner of one. I cut my uh, my consumption by half overnight. Didn't cost cost me three thousand dollars more than an, uh, than uh, the usual car in a way. Um, and I'm happy with it. It, it didn't. It's not a major impact on my lifestyle of the way things I'm, I'm doing. We could, we could all put solar PV in all. I mean, the message here: it's it's easy to implement. It's relatively inexpensive. It's achievable, and, but the, the, uh, the impact is not huge. It has a potential for large impact, but it's not. My, my idea about this is that the more public is educated, the better it is for the future. We want the kids to actually grow up knowing that energy is scarce, knowing that if we leave the light on all the time, we're going to consume more, and so on and so forth. This is going to be our future politicians, hopefully, and they're going to do something about it. So the next part is uh, utilize waste heat. And by far, this is a major issue that affects efficiency. I uh, happened to visit uh, uh, Wyala and one steel in there and see how much energy is wasted. Uh, you dump 90,000 tons of slag at 1,500 degrees C. Just dumped. And you think, well, you know, yes, they use it for, uh, to build roads, but there's a lot of energy in there. A lot of wasted energy, too. Um, interestingly, if you do, there's an infrared imaging from a satellite. If you look at the sort of map of uh, South Australia, you could actually find hot spots if you want. People are wasting a lot of energy one way or another. So this is why combined heat and power generation is actually a really viable option. And it has been implemented and should be more implemented. I think the state government here should implement a plan by which it encourages industries who need heat to go and establish itself next to where there's power generation or next to where there is a process by which heat is being dumped to the atmosphere. At the end of the day, we are going to benefit those who are supplying the heat and those who are actually using it too. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that this is actually have, is a key for substantial efficiency gains. Again, at the end of the day, we're going to reduce CO2, so we're using less fuels through more efficient systems. So I'm giving some examples of existing technology. One is what's called combined cycle gas turbine. So if you have a gas turbine, you're feeding uh, some methane to it, at the end of the day, you're going to end up with exhaust gas, 600, 800 degrees. Um, what do you do with this? I'll dump it to the atmosphere. This is wasted energy. If you actually feed it into a boiler, produce steam, you use the steam to generate more electricity in a way, then your efficiency could sort of be closer to 50% from something perhaps at 38 or less than that. There's now a new process also for coal called integrated gasification compound cycle, uh, or GCC. Here the coal is actually gasified using steam and air, and then we're producing what's called synthetic gas, hydrogen and CO, and we then clean it up, which help us sort of to uh, uh, also reduce the nasties that the coal, coal combustion produces, and then feed it into the turbines, and gain the benefits of this high efficiency. Innovative technology, there is a lot of good ideas out there. Uh, the key of them, too, is fuel flexibility. You know, there's a lot of market forces. We want systems that can take different fuels, that can take solid as well as liquid, as well as 
uh, other types of, uh, uh, of fuels. I know it's hard, I know it's challenging, I know it will cost more than capital costs, but the benefits at the end of the day is quite big. Um, today there's this super critical, ultra super critical uh, coal-fired boilers, which operate at a high pressure and high temperature. And again, the efficiencies are sort of edging towards 50%. It's higher capital costs due to thicker walls and higher temperatures, but it's actually inexistent. Pre pressurized, pressurized day pulverized coal combustion could actually uh, grind it so fine it becomes like um, a gas. If it's actually go to the fairly small scale, you could actually feed it into diesel engines if you want to. So again, uh, this, is, this is not mature technology, it's under development, but also has potential in a way. Um, there's something I'm working on called moderate or intense low oxygen dilution or mild combustion. And those who argue that it needs big investments to do these things, I, I, here's an example where it doesn't. I have a furnace uh, which I use in the university, and this furnace can be operated on conventional or mild combustion. And with this, with this new mode, which includes heat recirculation, we're talking about waste heat utilization, you could actually improve the heat, uh, the thermal efficiency by almost 30%. You could drop NOx down to PPM level, five or less than 10, 10 PPM level. And it's a simple, fluid mechanics stuff. It's low cost, uh, it's a promising technology, it has fuel flexibility. I ran it with solid fuels too and it did work. So it needs development investment, so this becomes the uh, technology of choice. There's another idea of underground coal gasification. Why do we have to dig the coal out, transport it, gasify it, and then use it? Well, there is a new technology that we actually could use it underground. Now, I try to uh, uh, separate those between those actually who are ready to de deploy it today and those actually are under development. And certainly this is uh, low cost if you look at the holistic sort of approach. It's complex, and, but it's under development. So this is not ready for tomorrow. So mature technology is available, it is deployable, and it will have a major impact. The other, uh, the other point I want to make is uh, this hybridization. Today, um, uh, renewable sources are thermodynamically inefficient. Uh, the temperatures that they generate is not high enough for you to get sort of high efficiency. They are intermittent, obviously, except for geothermal. So if it's seasonal or it's sun, you know, it's only during the day or, you know, where the wind is not up and so on. And they're still expensive, of course, because there's infrastructure involved and so on. What we came up with in the, in the center is um, an in, in the integration idea. We, we thought, well, if we combine renewable sources with combustion, then we could get base load power. We could have a substantial increase in efficiency, up to 42%, we find. A reduction in capital cost, because we could operate the systems 24 hours, not only during the day, and then we have to put uh, a, a lot of storage, which is expensive. And we have the flexibility to turn which one on and off. If, if the electricity is actually get the highest uh, market price at three o'clock uh, in a, uh, a hot summer day, guess what? This is when the sun is up, yeah, and it has the hottest point of the day. This is where you get most of your gains in. But you can supplement it during the night with combustion or geothermal energy. So the point in here, and by the way, this uh, we, we have... Uh, we have patented this technology and we, uh, there's, gra there's uh, grant applications and we're hoping to be able to develop it further. So technology is being developed. It, it, there's a, a little bit of increase in capital gain, but there's a major impact to make a, uh, a renewable energy more, more efficient. Um, perhaps I took a bit more than I thought I would, but uh, I wanted to show you this figure and see how that we need, this is figure we need to climb to be able to actually make uh, these energy technology viable or at least implemented. And most of it is actually is where the, where the yellow one is. And to be able to get up there where the technology is mature and, and efficient uh, and independent running by itself and competitive in a way, uh, we need a lot of uh, political willpower for it to get in there so the market could take its place as well as uh, uh, some subsidies to actually make it happen. Last point is um, that we need to look at a holistic approach in my mind. 
So where there's environment and core impact uh, uh, for different alternative technologies, you see on the right column there the CO2 emission as compared to ultra supercritical uh, coal fire plants. And you could see that most of the alternative have green. So uh, uh, many of you or some of you may not like some of the options in there, but they're actually viable options. I'll just leave you with a figure showing the difference between conventional and mild combustion. In the mild combustion, actually, the flame disappears. It becomes what's called flameless in a way. The action is still happening, but there is no flame. Thank you. So you put up a diagram showing the wedges of future energy, and there was a diverse array of technologies there, including various fossil fuels with and without CCS, renewables and nuclear and so on. Given that the history of energy is not like that, if we look back to pre-industrial society, it was 100% solar energy in one form or another, and if we look to the industrial world, it's all been based on carbon-based energy, predominantly coal, oil and some gas. Why do you imagine that in the future all of these different technologies will compete? Or, or is it more credible to expect that there'll be a few winners and many losers out of that, that wedge? Well, I do acknowledge that uh, market forces are going to push those wedges to become infinitesimal or even larger. However, um, we need to give all of them a chance to, to succeed. As I showed before, it is actually quite green in lots of aspects in terms of environmental impact. I'm not too fussed about which one of them becomes more viable or not. I'm more uh, inclined to believe that uh, in different parts of the world, there will be niche markets by which certain technologies are more viable than others. For example, sorry, um, it makes a lot of sense for us to use solar technology, and certainly not for Norway or Finland yet. So different things would actually, different places in the world would, would need to use different type of technology, I think. How conceivable is it that we could replace fossil fuels completely within 20 years? Uh, zero. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Not only that we can't deploy renewable energy quick enough to replace it. And you need to also remember that, for example, Australia, by 2050, it's going to need twice as much energy as we're consuming today. The other reason for that is that there's a lot of uh, industrial processes that uh, rely heavily on high temperature uh, fluids. And those cannot be provided from the alternative sources that are available up here. We're not going to be using nuclear soon for, for that. So uh, uh, the, re the, 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 the thought that fossil fuel is going to disappear is actually laughable. Be not because uh, uh, we don't have the will to do it, it's basically we don't have the means to be able to implement it, nor that we have a replacement for what it can offer in the foreseeable future. To take one example of the efficiencies you talked about was using waste heat more efficiently. Surely that's also very much an economic argument, and in places where, for instance, you have cold winters, that would be useful for combined heat and power, in somewhere like South Australia, what would you do with that waste heat? And when would it become economic to use that? Well, I think um, this requires um, a bit of um, leadership from, from governments, I believe. Uh, I've spent a few months in, in Germany as part of my sabbatical, and there is next to this small town, there's a power station, and all of our uh, heating was actually coming from that particular power station. Although these days are a bit cold, but I don't think in an Australian, in a South Australian context, uh, home heating is going to be an option for us. But uh, I truly believe that uh, if the government uh, have a plan in terms of utilizing the waste heat, um, it should then uh, encourage uh, industries and give incentives to industries to build next to larger uh, emitters of least waste heat to be able to be utilized. Uh, it, it's not expensive to some extent because this heat is being wasted. It's actually going up in the air. Yeah? If you can get some money for it, and somebody who uh, is going to use it and use it actually cost effectively in a way, it's actually a win-win at the end of the day. But what it needs, it needs a bit more uh, 
sort of projection or for, uh, future look at what our needs are, where the industry should locate, and uh, especially those who rely heavily on, on energy uh, should, uh, should think twice where they should build and how they could utilize it.